good morning to you. Really uh, excited about what God is doing. Was really refreshed by worship this morning. Um, excited to get into the scriptures with you. As you are aware, and Anthony mentioned, we are in a series through a book of the Bible, one that Paul the Apostle wrote, uh, the letter to the Corinthian church. So we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you would go ahead and turn there at this time, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we will be finishing the chapter, uh, just a few short verses, looking uh, beginning in verse 24. So when you get it, say, I got it. All right. And we're going to pick it up in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, and they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is a season in the world, and especially in the United States, that everybody is really excited about the 2016 Olympics coming to Rio. How many of y'all excited about the Olympics coming in August? And, I mean, the, the funny thing about the Olympic Games is the idea that there are going to be millions of Americans sitting on their couches with a bag of potato chips, watching the world's elite and criticizing and critiquing their technique <laughs> in the spirit of the Olympic Games. I was reading about one particular gentleman who got really excited in the spirit of the Olympics, and so he decided to swim the Atlantic Ocean from France to New York, 3,600 miles. And he wasn't an Olympian. And so, as the story goes, true story, he makes it two miles before lifeguards have to come and rescue him from his endeavor to swim 3,600 miles in the Atlantic, which means he made it 0.0006% of the distance he set out for. Uh, the reason is because you don't just become an Olympian without years of training and strict training. Actually, we're told that uh, by Malcolm Gladwell in his research on people who have done anything to mastery, that it takes what he calls the 10,000 hour rule, 10,000 hours before a person actually gains mastery over any subject. And, and that would hold true to the Olympics. Actually, in, in 2012, uh, the Olympic Games in London revealed the research showed that the average Olympic athlete commits six hours a day, six days a week, 12 months a year to training and to competitions. And most of the Olympians, before they make it and qualify for the Olympics, have been working at it for 11 years. And they seriously would have had to take up their sport most at 14 years of age and compete consistently in seven international competitions per year. So the Olympics is no joke. So when you are sitting on your couch with some chips and guac and criticizing the gymnastic floor routine or the swimmers or whatever, just realize that, bro, you couldn't hold a candle to them. Like, seriously. Um, and Paul writes what he writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the spirit of an Olympian. He uses athletic imagery as was common in much of Paul's writing. He uses Olympic, the Olympics as an illustration because as you may well be aware of, it was the Greek culture that invented or first came up with the Olympic Games. And in the city to which Paul is writing his letter, Corinth, they had an event, not the Olympics, but what they called the Ithmian Games. And the Ithmian Games were very similar to our equivalent of the Olympics today. 
And so when Paul writes to Corinth in these athletic, Olympic, Olympiad imagery, it's very much contextual. They would understand exactly what he's talking about. And so Paul actually brings up two of the events that are his favorite. I know you probably have your favorite event in the Olympics, if you follow the Olympics. Well, Paul's two that he seems to favor is the runners and the boxers. And so in verse 26, he talks both about running in the Olympic Games and also boxing in the Olympic Games. Those two being his vivid metaphor for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He uses the strict, brutal, competitive Olympic Games to illustrate discipleship and following the Lord. Now, Paul often used sports as illustrations for Christian spiritual uh, life, the way to live your life for the Lord. Actually, we're told that 12 different times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul used uh, athletic event type of illustrations such as runners and those fighting in an arena, and and on and on. He uses these kinds of imagery to remind us of what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And so this morning, really what I want to put out before us is a question. And then we're going to unpack that based on Paul's response. And that is, what does it look like, or what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Not just a believer in Jesus, but a follower of Jesus. What does that mean? And what does the Bible and Paul have to say about following Jesus? Now, it may surprise you, but the term we use to describe ourselves is typically Christian. People say, what's your religion? You would say, I'm a Christian. If you're a little bit more sophisticated, you might say, I'm a Protestant Christian or I'm a Lutheran Christian. But most people just say, I'm a Christian. But the term Christian if you didn't know this, is only used three times in the whole New Testament. And so for us to continually go by the title, realize that that isn't the predominant title or way in which the scriptures address our identity. Yes, we are Christians. Christians means those that belong to Jesus. That's all that means. But there are other terms that the Bible uses as well that are very important. And one that I want to bring forth for us this morning in our discussion is this term disciple. That's a term you need to become familiar with. The word disciple means apprentice or learner, or actually in that day, it was a Hebrew idea of the Talmudim. And the Talmudim were students of a rabbi or a master or a teacher. And you would request to become a student of one rabbi or master that you admired. And to become their Talmudim, to become their apprentice, you would have to stick close by your rabbi. Literally, they had a saying that you should allow yourself to be cloaked or covered in the dust of your rabbi. That is, be so close to your rabbi that his dust will literally cover you. Learn his ways. So disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, were those who traveled in close proximity and learned his every way and manner, not just his teaching but the way he touched people, the way he talked to people, the way he lived his life. That's what true discipleship is. It has the image of being close to the Lord Jesus, to really being devoted. And within the word, disciple is a word that we don't often like. It's the word discipline. If you want to be an Olympic athlete or elite in anything in the world, if you want to learn to play the violin, if you want to learn to play an instrument, if you want to be classically trained pianist, if you want to do anything to its greatest level of excellence, it is going to require hours and hours of blood, sweat, and tears, and discipline to master that craft. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to not just say, I adhere to the orthodox doctrines of Christianity, but to say, I am following in the way of my master, Jesus Christ. And that starts with learning, but it doesn't stay there, because the Bible tells us the way in which we are to follow Jesus is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And I divide the Christian community into three categories as it concerns following Jesus. You are internally wired a particular way. Some of you guys are heart and soul followers. I mean, it's like prayer and sing and bow knees and weep and tongues and prophecy and visions. And you are heart and soul, man. Your heart is out there. You are passionate for Jesus. Invite you to a prayer meeting or a worship night or a healing service. You are on that. Others of you, that's just not a particular way in which you're wired internally to connect with God. You're more of the mind Christian. Man, give me a systematic theology. Let's have a Bible study. Let's parse Greek verbs. Let's talk deep, orthodox, doctrine, theology, omnipresence, uh, manifest presence, the glory theology. Let's get into this. Let's break down the scriptures, man. I love the Lord, the God, my God with my mind. I'm philosophical. I'm rational. I'm apologetic. That's some of y'all. And then some of you are strength Christians, what I call loving the Lord your God with all your strength. You're doers. You think the church needs to do more. Where's your social justice? Where's your mission strips? How are you serving the poor? How are you serving your neighborhood? Do, love the Lord your God with your strength. And guess what? I love all of that. I'm wired a particular way, but guess what? I believe that we are to be a people who love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul. Yeah, heart and soul, worship, passion. But then love God with your mind. Think well. Don't be ridiculous. Don't live by bumper stickers on the back of cars and cat posters and little silly cliches and devotionals that don't really mean much. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Disciple, discipline, passion, mind, and then body, act, train, do, serve. So I want to bring up three things that the Apostle Paul from this text, I believe, brings up about being a teacher or, excuse me, a student, a disciple, a vigorous follower of the way of our rabbi Jesus. So three things um, for you to consider. Number one, I believe to be a disciple, you have to, number one, have the mentality to run to win. Number one, run to win. Number two, disciples are disciplined. And number three, there is something to lose. There is something to lose. And we'll unpack those as we go along. But I do want to say this. It is possible to believe in Jesus and to even have what we would call a a, a conversion experience where you are going to go to heaven when you're dead, but to not be a disciple. And there's a statement that Jesus made in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, that I think we need to sort of keep in front of us as we live our lives. And that is the statement that Jesus made. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I mean, how can you call me boss? How can you call me master? And you disobey my word. You don't follow my instructions. You aren't a Talmudim. You aren't my apprentice. You aren't my disciple. And I want to say that in our community, I know there's a variety of people in a variety of places and they're following of Jesus, but my prayer is that at whatever stage you are, that you are a follower, not just a believer. Not just someone who says yes to that, but, but a group of men and women who are disciples of the way of Jesus who say, if it's not right and it's in my life, I will repent and fight against that thing. If it's a discipline that's hard and requires some energy from me, I will take that up upon myself. I will become a man or woman of prayer. I will become someone who studies the Bible. I will become a doer. I will, I will learn to worship the Lord with all my heart and soul. Let us be disciples, lest Jesus look at us and say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you to do? So let's look at the first point in this discipleship or spiritual disciplines, what I'm calling it, instruction teaching from Paul. So first of all, we mentioned run to win. Notice what Paul says in verse 24. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, a temporary wreath, but we do it to gain a crown that will last forever. Therefore, 
I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. So the illustrative metaphors that Paul employs is a runner and a boxer. Fighting and running. Both of those which Paul says, I, when I do these things as a disciple, a follower of Jesus, as you're watching the Olympics, remember, I'm running to win. I want first prize. I'm not entering into this contest just to place somewhere. Number 36, thanks for participating. Everybody's a winner. Paul said, no, I'm in the race to win the race. I'm in the boxing ring to win because only one winner comes out of this thing. Only one gets to stand on the top and wear the gold medal. So now you might be going, okay, so, so Christianity is a competition. So I'm competing against Eric Newby. I'm like, bro, you ain't beating me. I, I'm, try, I'm trying to get in the ring with Stephen Hall, who's been trained as a boxer, so I'm not going to do so well. But, but, but the, the reality of Christianity is your race, your boxing match, is not a race or a boxing match against the people that are sitting all around you. Your race is against yourself. Actually, Jesus told a parable about what it means to run the race or to live in a way in which you are actually competing against yourself. In Matthew 25 and also Luke 19, Jesus gave that famed parable of the talents or the pounds in which a master going away to a far off place on a journey entrusts each one of his servants with a different measure, a different amount of talent. One is given one talent to the other three, to the other five. And the master says, when I come back, I'm going to see how you did with what I gave you. That is Christianity, brothers and sisters. It's a race against the potential in which, the calling in which God has given you. So if that be true, if you are Paul, or you're following Rabbi Paul, and he says to you, run to win the race, I know I'm not running to win my race against you, I'm running against myself. And therefore, I have to be very aware of how God has made me. Whom God has called me to be. And I fear that a lot of Christians struggle in this arena of their identity, of their calling, of who they are. But the Apostle Paul was one who early on in his conversion had a very clear sense of that's my race. This is my calling. I know what I've been called to do. How did he receive that? In Acts chapter 9, on that Damascus road, as Paul was having a conversion experience, the Lord tapped a man on the shoulder by the name of Ananias. And the Lord told Ananias what Paul's calling was to be. And I'll read it to you out of Acts chapter 9. The Lord spoke this to Ananias about Paul and his calling. The Lord said, This man, speaking of Paul, is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. When you think of calling, if I were to just bring you up here cold, just call one of you randomly up here, Blair, what's your calling? There are three things that I believe are a part of a calling. And I think we all have one, and you need to know it so that you can run to win the race. You can get in the ring to win the fight. You're not in there to drop. You're in there to get a TKO, right, Stephen? Or even a KO would be better, right? You're, you're in the arena to win. You're running to win. You're boxing to win. Therefore, if you're going to win the race, you better know what event you're in. You better know, am I high jump or pole vault? Am I like, am I like running the mile or am I running like the 100-yard dash? Am I swimming or am I on the gymnastics floor? If you don't even know what event you're in, then brother, sister, you're full on lost. You don't know how to run. And I think a lot of Christians, unfortunately, are at that place. So as you consider your calling, I want you to consider what Ananias heard from the Lord about Paul. And I want to translate that into our own calling. So three elements of a calling. First of all, notice the nature of your calling. What did Ananias or the Lord say about Paul? He was a chosen instrument to proclaim my name. He's my instrument, he's my vessel, and his gift is to speak, to proclaim. Not everybody's gift is to proclaim. Paul's was an instrument who was focused on proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was intelligent, learned, and so his gift 
was to articulate and make known the work and person of Jesus Christ to go into the world with the gospel. So first of all, to identify calling is the nature of your calling. Paul knew, I'm a proclaimer, I'm a gospel preacher, I'm an evangelist. I'm to go as an apostle into the world with this news. Secondly, the particular duty, the realm in which you are to use that calling. For Paul, it was to Gentiles, very specifically, not to his Jewish brethren at first, to their kings. He was going to go speak, proclaim to kings, as we see in the book of Acts, and to the people of Israel. So now Paul has an audience. It's a pretty big audience, but he knows he's initially going to the nations with the proclamation of the gospel. So Paul takes three missionary journeys and reaches the known world with the gospel. Because Jesus told him, you are my instrument for proclamation. You're going to go to the Gentiles, to their kings, and to your own people, Israel. All of which Paul experienced and fulfilled in his life's ministry. Thirdly, it's the cost involved. With every calling, there is a cost. In whatever assignment God gives you, count the cost. The cost for Paul? I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. If you haven't read Paul, you need to read Paul. Paul suffered greatly. Starvation, cold, heat, deserts, wilderness, lost on sea, shipwrecked multiple times, beaten with rods, left for dead, stoned, left for dead, in prison, whipped, I mean, multiple times, it just experienced complete devastation, persecution. So there's this great calling. You're my instrument to go proclaim my name to the nations, to the Gentiles who've never heard, and to their kings. And you're to go to your own people, Israel. That's all, that sounds great. But then let's be real. It's going to cost you something. You want to be in the Olympics? It's going to cost you something. You can't goof around all the time. You've got to go on a diet. You've got to go on some strict training. You have to realize that with every call, there is a cost. And if you want a calling, and you want to live in your calling, it's going to cost you something. So enough of this weak sauce Christianity that says, yes, I want to follow Jesus in the way of the cross, but it better not cost me any money or any time or any energy. Fully on that. What are we talking about here? That the way of Jesus is a costly way. The way of the cross is the way of death to self. The way of a disciple is to walk the way that Jesus walked. Is it joyful? Absolutely. Is it painful? Yes, it is. Is it going to cost you? Absolutely. And I want to live a life that's costly. Not because I'm foolhardy or masochistic, but with a calling comes a cost. And I want a calling, and with it comes a cost. I would that every man and woman and child that is a part of the Emmaus community would be able to communicate what is the calling, what is the duty, what is the specific arena, the particular arena of that duty, and what is it going to cost me. And I'm not saying you need to get on a boat or on a plane, or leave this land, but you need to look at where you're at right now. And maybe you're a school teacher. And the Lord would say, I have called you, Miranda, Lucas, to the Durham County School District. Is that where you're at? Okay, yes. Um, and, and, and to the students, and to the faculty, and to the school district. And, and, and th that, is, that is your calling. You're a teacher of the next generation in the public school system in Durham and you're going to minister to the kids, to their parents, to the faculty and, and, and to uh, even broader than that, the district. But it's going to cost you. You're going to make a lot of money. Sorry. You had to pay a lot for school and you don't get a lot of return. And it's going to be emotionally agonizing as you bear with these kids and, and, and deal with their parents and see what's going on in the world. You have a front row seat to the brokenness and depravity of a world far away from Eden, the place God intended us. But that is Miranda, your calling. And, and would to God that we would be able to articulate those kinds of callings. Maybe someone here works in, in a hospital and the Lord would say to you, you called to Wake Med or whatever hospital, UNC that you're working at, to the cancer ward to cancer patients and their families and the other nurses and doctors and to the organization. And it's going to cost you pain as you watch people face death. Emotionally, it's going to cost you time and energy and emotion. But it is your calling. Run to win. Fight to get the knockout. This, this life is short. 
The calling is sure and it requires that you run to win the race. Run hard. Run to win. Get serious. Compete for the prize because only one gets the prize, Paul says. But you're in a race with yourself. Who are you? What has God given you to do? What are you good at? What are you not so good at? What are some things you're trying that the Lord would say, that's not for you? Other things you lay your hand to, God says, that's for you. That's not for bragging rights. You should be able to hear people say, you're not so good at that, but you are good at that. Receive that as an indication of your calling. And then run. Work. Fight. Chase. Be a disciplined one. Follow the way of Jesus and the calling he's given you. Secondly, and probably my least favorite point that I made up, um, but I think it's in the text, so I have to face it. Number two, disciples are disciplined. Verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Could you describe your Christian life that way? <laughs> are you in strict training right now? Are you an Olympian? Are you preparing your life for something? Are you involved in what the ancients called spiritual disciplines? You know, in Corinth, this was when Paul talks about going into strict training, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Because all the athletes that were going to compete in the Ithmian Games in Corinth showed up one year prior to the event and in front of the whole city were in vigorous training. And so the Corinthians had a very, maybe this was actually, as Paul was writing this, this is what he was seeing out his window. He was seeing the athletes train for the Ithmian Games. And as they were reading this, they could look out their windows and say, yes, it's the Olympic season. And yes, they are in training. And yes, this is strict and vigorous. And part of strict and vigorous training is that there are some things you have to abstain from that are good. Dessert, is that good? Yes, heaven sent. Should you have it while you're in strict training? Nope. Late night movies and fun with your friends, is that good? Oh, yes, it is. But not when you're in strict training. When you're in strict training, you have to say no to some good things for better things. And so, so sometimes in Christianity, we want all of it. And sometimes the Lord calls you into a season to exercise yourself under spiritual disciplines. And as the ancients divided spiritual disciplines, and if you're interested in the subject of spiritual disciplines, I would recommend a book, an older book, by a guy named Richard Foster, and it's just called Spiritual Disciplines. The latest book I read on discipleship that I've been talking about a lot that I would also recommend to you is a book by John Stott called Radical Disciple. Those two books should be in every Christian library. And as it concerns the subject of spiritual disciplines, and maybe you haven't heard much about this before, but I would say if we are going to be Olympians for the Lord, disciples, apprentices of Jesus, some of these spiritual disciplines must apply to our lives. And, and there are two essential categories associated with spiritual disciplines. Um, the first is in a category of disciplines of abstinence, as they would categorize them in spiritual disciplines. And these are areas in which we deny ourselves in order to focus more fully on the Lord. So some of the disciplines of abstinence are the discipline of solitude. Being alone with God. Taking time for quiet solitude. I was talking with someone the other day and she was saying that she went camping and I, you know, my assumption was it was a social thing. And she went by herself for solitude. And I thought, I was convicted by that. Was, when was the last time I spent 24 hours alone for the mere purpose of being alone with God? There's also the disciplines of silence, extended periods of quiet, listening, refraining from talking, just hearing God, listening to the bird, being in nature, being outside, being quiet for periods of time. Then there is our least favorite, the discipline of fasting. You know, it's funny. <laughs> Some of you guys may have said this to me, so I'm sorry if I am bringing up a conversation. When we talk about fasting, a lot of people say, well, there is fasting that like I can fast from Facebook. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to fast from technology, okay. But fasting means food. I'm going to fast from chocolate, Okay. But fasting specifically in the Bible, we're not talking Facebook or Netflix here or couch time. Fasting is food, and that's hard. But there is something about, the Bible talks about in Isaiah 58, setting oneself apart, not giving in to your physical appetites 
in order that you might deny your flesh. Because if your flesh is out of control, there's nothing more clear than your physical body appetite to represent all appetites. You're hungry. Your stomach wants to be fed. And so does your flesh. When you say no to your flesh, you can say no in this area. You can say no in other areas. Key way for men struggling with sexual immorality, fast. Key way for people struggling with anger or any aberrant sin of the flesh, fast. Deprive your flesh. Say, learn to say no to your body. Don't let your body be on top. Let your spirit be on top. Don't let your flesh always get the best of you. You don't always have to give in. And then finally, another discipline of abstinence, those things which we stay away from in order to focus more fully on the Lord is the discipline of Sabbath. It's a hard thing for American people, but a dedicated period of time, a 24-hour period of time, ideally that you say, I'm going to trust God and that I am not God and that be, me being on the clock or having, answering every text message or my emails, perpetually checking my emails or whatever, I don't always have to be on. I can take 24 hours and say, God is reigning in this world. The world's not going to fall apart if Brian Fowler is for 24 hours quietly resting in the Lord. We all need 24 hours of Sabbath. If you don't have that as a regular, good, solid rhythm in your life, I would say do what you can to fight towards getting yourself 24 hours to be quiet, to have leisure, to rest from your work. And then secondly, category of disciplines uh, is disciplines of action. These are ways we actively pursue God and others. Number one is the discipline of Bible reading. And I would suggest a daily practice of reading a piece of scripture every single day. Meditating on the Word of God every day. A discipline of prayer also. A way in which I'm intentionally getting alone with God, not just to talk, but also to listen. To dialogue with the Lord. To share my heart with God. And I would say ideally it should be the first part of your day. Because if you start your day off checking Facebook, checking your emails, headed off to work with that cup of coffee in a rush... You have not had the quality of time to meditate on Scripture and to talk with the Father about things that you're going through or to even listen for orders for the day. There's also the discipline of community connection. Now, for some of you who are more introverted, this is more difficult. That is, being intentional about showing hospitality, building gospel friendships, connecting with people that you need in your life. There are people I need in my life. I need to welcome into my life. So there is, I believe, a discipline of connecting with the people of God, um, men and women who love and follow Jesus for friendship, for prayer, for, for all the things that we need. Then there is the discipline of reflection. And this is one that I think I'm most convicted of because it's one I'm not as good at. My wife is very good at this one. She has filled volumes of journals. But it's that time when you are letting God help you reflect on your life. You just start asking the honest questions and have a little notebook out and just like, Lord, in this area with my wife or with my job, with my finances, with my kids, and just allow God to speak into those things. But, but reflect upon your life. Where am I headed? Have I taken some wrong turns? It's time to allow your life to get refreshed, to hit the refresh button on your life. And, and I think it's an important thing that maybe weekly, we are reflective people. That we don't just let life take over and we live under the tyranny of the urgent and then you wake up one day and years have passed by. Live a reflective life. So let me ask you this. Of these disciplines, what of these are already in your life? Continue those. And are there others that you would say, boy, I could really work on that one or those? And, and are there specific things in the calling that God has given you that you would say, I need to implement this solitude, this silence, this life of reflection, this dedicated Bible reading, or this community connection. I need to bring good people into my life or fasting because my, my, my fleshly appetites are out of control. I'm overeating, I'm overindulging, I'm being lazy. But what is it about being a disciple of Jesus that the Spirit of God is convicting your heart right now and say, just take this one thing and run with it, that you might be a disciple of Jesus, that you might be a, 
Olympian for the Lord. And then the final one I'm just going to mention is the discipline of service. Finding ways to sacrificially serve other people. So Paul is talking to us about what it is to be a disciple, what it is to be an athlete competing in the games to win. First of all, run to win. Second of all, disciples are disciplined. And finally, and this one may take a little bit of thought, but there is something to lose. Look at verse 27. These are God's words, Paul's words, not mine. Verse 27, Paul says, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Then he says, no, I strike a blow to my body. Literally, it's I give myself a black eye. I, 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 I physically afflict myself and make my body my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. In the Ithmian games, if you were trying to, to compete in the games, you could be disqualified from the games. If you were found like, let's say, you know, using performance-enhancing drugs or something like that. Um, uh, if you were cheating, you would be disqualified. And Paul says, I don't want to be disqualified. I want to run to win. I want to fight to get the victory. Here's the tension in Christianity. On one level, absolute gospel truth, you are not saved by works. You are saved by faith, by grace, through faith. That not of yourself, it's a gift of God lest anyone should boast. So, so this is not a works teaching. But on the other end, Paul says you can lose the prize. You can be disqualified from, com from competition. And Paul says, I don't want to lose the prize. He's talking to a Greek audience here. In order to compete for the prize, you had to be a Greek citizen. Not everyone was guaranteed entrance into the games, but all Greek citizens could be Greek citizens, even if they were caught cheating in their training. You don't lose your citizenship, you just lose your ability to compete. That's Christianity, brothers and sisters. It's not your salvation that's on the line right now. It's not your salvation that God is saying you'll lose the prize being, being saved, but you can lose the ability to compete in the games. And the Bible speaks a lot about reward, specifically in terms of crown. And you might think, I don't care about crowns. Like I've never been into crowns. I never wore my tiara as a little girl. I was never a boy wearing a crown. I don't care about crowns. But, but crowns, like in the military, it's like stripes on a uniform or pins on the officer's uh, lapel or whatever. Those pins aren't the value, it's what they represent. Crowns in heaven represent place, position, and authority in the kingdom realms. You're going to care about that. It's not just wearing a crown and be like, look at my crown. It's a crown that says with that crown, here is your realm of authority. Here is your reward. Here is your purpose. A crown has an identifying piece to it. And Paul says, I want that crown. It matters. I'm running to win. I'm disciplining myself because I don't want to lose my ability to qualify to compete for the ultimate prize, the crown that God has intended for me if I will compete and run in this race called life. So the point is, and I need you guys to hear this, rewards can be lost. Salvation cannot. You can lose your reward, but you will not lose your citizenship. And I want to point out a couple of places where the Bible talks about rewards. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul, referring to those who plant and those who water in kingdom work, says each one, 1 Corinthians 3, 8, will be rewarded according to their own labor. There is a reward. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done in the body, whether they are good or bad, there will be a reward or a prize. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. There will be a harvest. There will be a reward. Revelation 22, verse 12. Jesus says, Look, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have 
done. And so Paul says, I'm running to win. I strike my body. I strike a blow to my body. I give myself a black eye if that's what I need to do. I do more crunches. I lift more weight. I run an extra mile. I'm doing speed work. I am sweating. I am bleeding because I know that the prize is valuable. But if you don't see the prize as valuable, then you won't go under strict training. But I promise you this, according to the scriptures, that there is something to lose. But it's not your citizenship, but it is reward. And rewards matter. Rewards are important in the kingdom age. I don't want to live my life in such a way that when I stand before God, I realize how much I just coasted along and relaxed and was not a disciple. Now this is a hard message because as I'm sticking the sword outward, it's coming around and going inward. I'm falling on my own sword here. And I know for a lot of people, along with this charge for discipleship is also coming the enemy's voice of condemnation. And you're hearing, oh great, I guess I have been disqualified because I've been sexually immoral. I was divorced. I have sinned greatly. I have a temper. I have hurt many people. I've been fired from jobs. I've been um, kicked out of churches. I have done things in my lifetime that I would think would have maybe disqualified me. Maybe you have a criminal record or you've made decisions that have limited your ability to be useful. And if the enemy is whispering that lie in your ear, Think about the man who's writing the words that we just read. He had Christians killed. If that isn't something that's on your record that says, you can't work at our church, sorry, sir. You know, I know you're applying for a position of assisting pastor, but you used to kill us, sorry. And you blaspheme God, sorry. What I want to say and what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to say is it's never too late until you're dead. Now, you may have disqualified yourself from this particular aspect of kingdom work. And, and that is a broken, hard thing to resolve. There are some things that some pastors do heartbreakingly that they are probably officially disqualified from taking the, the role of pastor again. But that doesn't mean that pastor's through. God has ways to redeem and reshape and use you and repurpose you. No one here is disqualified permanently. Don't Think of yourself as disqualified in the sense that you can't compete in the games. There is more than one athletic competition in these Olympics. And, and if you've had the heartbreaking experience of saying, at one time I was so useful here, but because of some sin that took over and some things I have done, I have been disqualified from this. I would say, how long are you going to mourn over this and not step into this? Like, like the Lord told Samuel, he said, how long are you going to mourn from the for, for the former King Saul? Fill your horn with oil and go anoint the new king. You can't live your life mourning about opportunity lost. God still has a reason for you to be here. Grab your wrist. Do you have a pulse? You're supposed to do something for God. You have a calling. And for some, I believe the Lord is saying, it's time to get back into training again. You just let yourself go flabby because you thought, you know, I'm disqualified. How can God use me? It's time to get back into training. It's time to say, God, I believe that you have a purpose for my life and I am not going to live the rest of my life on the excuse of the past mistakes I've made. God has washed those under his blood and he's waiting for you to be forgiven and to receive forgiveness. You are forgiven. Receive it and move on. Paul had to say, forgetting those things which lie behind, I press on for the prize. Someone here, I believe, maybe one person, simply needs to hear, Forget the past. It's gone. Especially that thing which you think, that disqualifies me. Hogwash. Lie. It may disqualify you from a realm that you used to be useful in, but you are not done yet, friend. God is yet to show you what the purpose of God is for your life. So when one opportunity seems to close down, and maybe it was even your fault, and you know it, I'd say believe in the God of purpose that he's going to repurpose and reshape your life. Because he's got something for all of us to do, amen? I want you to ask yourself a few questions as we go into this week and think through this concept of spiritual disciplines. And so this is what I leave you with. Uh, a few questions to ask yourself. Maybe discuss among your small groups. 
during the week or at least think about on your own during your time of solitude and reflection um, that I know all of you are going to set aside to discipline yourselves in. Number one, are you clear on the nature of God's calling on your life? Is that clear? And if not, maybe that's what you need to do some work on. Just spend some time waiting to hear from God. Ask people to pray for you today. If, if you're unclear, there's a group of us that would love to lay hands on you. Maybe God would speak through us. Maybe God would identify something. We've been doing that on Thursday mornings with the men. We pick a man's name out of a bowl and they've written down their name and what they feel their calling is and where they struggle and we'll just lay hands and speak over that guy's life. It was my turn in the hot seat last week. I was crying. It was embarrassing. Um, but it was good. So good for my soul to reinforce the calling God has on my life. Number two, question to ask yourself, as a disciple of Jesus, are you practicing spiritual disciplines? Which ones? Are you still on number two? I snuck four questions into one, uh, or into uh, three. Um, are you convicted of an area in your life where you lack discipline? Is there an area where the, God, the Lord's saying, it's right here. You sleep in too much. You don't read my word enough. You don't serve others. What is it? Number three, what are some dangers that may threaten your calling? What are some things you say, that this, this thing here, it, it, it threatens to disqualify me. I would hate to see one of you get disqualified. I, you know, la this last week, there was a, a great pastor. I mean, I, don't, I didn't follow his ministry, but I, I knew of him. I knew uh, he had a very large impact on a lot of people. Um, and he was this last week or so disqualified from his pastoral position because of alcoholism. And he confessed it or he was caught or however it worked out. And it's sad. And a lot of people don't know where to file that. And, you know, I'm sure he's getting a lot of hate mail and being condemned by the devil and feeling terrible. Um, that guy's not done. God's not done with that guy. If you think God's done with that guy, you need to read your Bible. He may never step into the pulpit again. And that's okay. He doesn't need, you don't need to lead a church to be useful to God. You don't need to be in a ministry quote unquote, to be useful to God. God has all kinds of ways you can be useful to him. And, and the best places are in the marketplace anyway, I think, in my opinion. But you hear about that and you think, God, what, what, could, what could we do to be in each other's lives in such a way so that we don't end up getting disqualified? I'm gonna suggest two things and then I really am done. This is the conclusion of the conclusion. Um, You and I need to do a better job at talking to our friends about the things that we could potentially get sidelined by, disqualified by. If you don't have a few people in your corner that know you so well they could have you thrown in jail, you're not living well. <laughs> you need some people that, go, that you can say, listen, this is something that threatens my calling all the time. It's this sin, it's this insecurity. That's on you. On us, on we, is to stand with you in that. And to say, listen, we're going to fight with you over that thing. I just say, don't be an unknown Christian. If you're an unknown Christian, you don't have real friendships, I don't want to just talk to you about surface level stuff. What is threatening your life? I don't want you sidelined. I don't want you disqualified. I don't want to be disqualified. We've got to stand in each other's corners. But you have to commit yourself to honest confession. Confess your faults one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. You have something that is threatening your life. You have a beautiful calling and on the other side there's this other tension that's pulling you away that would disqualify you. Paul says, I would give myself a black eye just not to get disqualified because the prize is so worth it. We've got to be serious about each other. I want you to win the event as much as I want to win the event myself. And as those th things begin to work in tandem, you need to be honest and I need to be, I need to be completely for you and helping you along the way in that. I want to fight the things that fight you with you. I want you to know what I'm, I want some people to know, not all of you, but some of you to know what fights me 
so that you can get in my corner and say, Brian, anytime that ugly, devilish temptation of the flesh comes, I will stand in your corner, but you got to be honest. It's going to start with you, and then it's going to go to us. But if you're a part of Emmaus, and you don't have a squad, as my daughter calls it, you don't have your people, it wouldn't surprise me if you ended up being disqualified. And I don't want that for you. Neither does the Lord. He loves you too much. He's put too much in you to let you get disqualified. That's why we exist as a people. If, 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 if only for that alone we exist for each other to make sure that you're living a life that glorifies God. Amen?